Okay. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I know we're in for a treat with our guest speaker, Irene Scricky, uh, from the Center for Financial. For the Center for Financial. Okay. Um, I think we're going to start this over again. For the Con Center for Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I know you'll be glad you did because we have a wonderful presentation planned uh, with Irene Scricky, the Senior Financial Education Program Analyst from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. We're really thrilled to have her with us. We appreciate um, her being here. We also appreciate the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Anyone who knows me knows how often I refer to them and that I think it is about the greatest thing, uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, that um, we've ever um, had as consumers. My name is Rita Wolfson. I am your host for today and I apologize for the ringing phone. I thought I had that under control. So let's get started. Our agenda for today, I will speak briefly on financial social work basics and then on financial wellness and financial social work, the direction we've been moving here at the Center for Financial Social Work around financial wellness. Then Irene will do her presentation on financial well-being, the goal of financial education. This is such an exciting time and topic. Uh, then I'll speak quickly about financial social work and we will go on to the questions and answers. If you have any questions and answers, uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, you can um, type those into the question box. And we ha do have just one poll for you today. And additionally, um, I will be asking a question in a few slides down that I would appreciate your answering in that question box. So what is financial social work? With such a um, large uh, registration for today, we know we have many new people with us. So I'm going to just briefly explain what financial social work is, what it looks like and what it does. So it is a behavioral model which engages clients on the journey to sustainable long-term financial behavioral change. What makes it so special and so different? That would be the fact that it is a behavioral model. That is important because until and unless behavior changes, nothing changes. So financial social work is very interactive, introspective, and highly experiential. It's multidisciplinary and heavily psychosocial it is very much strength-based and succeeds whether working with clients individually or in a group. The model is an ongoing model of engagement, uh, financial education, motivation, validation, and support. And that's because we have learned over the past years that that is what people need to succeed in creating sustainable, long-term financial behavioral change. So where does behavioral change happen? I'm gonna show you in a second. Uh, the work looks like this. It is based upon the fact that it's your relationship with money that drives your financial behavior. Your financial behavior is how you uh, earn, spend, save, and share, and it's your financial behavior which determines your financial circumstances. It is as simple and as complicated as that, and this is really where that magic happens. It's how you behave with your money, how you interact with it, and that, of course, is driven by your relationship with money, and this is what determines financial circumstances. Um, excuse me, Rita. Yes. Sorry, I'm not sure if you're doing something different in terms of the uh, your voice, of the microphone, but your your voice is kind of coming in and out. 
Okay, I'll try to do better. Thanks a lot, Dorley. Uh, I'm sorry, everyone. Dorley uh, is with us today, too. She is our consultant, and she always brings so much to everything we do. And hope this is going to help, Dorley. So, uh, 10 goals of financial social work. And these are important because they really address that behavioral component. We work to help clients understand why they are in their current financial circumstances. And it's certainly not as simple as they spend too much or earn too little. We help clients identify where they want to be financially in the future by understanding why you are where you are and recognizing and identifying where you want to be. You then have that opportunity to create a plan for success and for a better financial future which is, of course, the equivalent of uh, financial well-being. Uh, we help clients to be more aware of their financial behavior, how they earn, spend, save, and share. We help them be able to cope with the stress of financial problems. And time and again, year after year, the APA research shows that financial problems are the uh, major uh, problems that people experience. Uh, we help clients eliminate the actions and habits that sabotage financial well-being and set and work to achieve financial goals. We help them address the emotional issues which drive financial behavior, and there are many. Uh, we help them develop core money management skills and understand the relationship between taking control of their money and gaining control of their lives. That relationship makes all the difference in the world. And most of all, we really want to make people feel more friendly with their money, not to consider it the enemy, not to think about it as a negative, and not to blame everything on their money. So today, we are looking at financial wellness, definitely one of the seven dimensions of all health and wellness. And again, so excited to have the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau with us. Traditionally, well-being has, has focused on improving physical, emotional, and mental quality of life. And that meant it was essentially overlooking how dependent physical, emotional, and mental well-being are on financial health. So historically, financial well-being uh, when considered all, has been associated with the financial planning industry and focused primarily on building and protecting wealth. But there's so much more involved. So what is financial wellness? I thought we could begin, before I talk about financial wellness at the Center for Financial Social Work, and Irene strictly uh, does her presentation for Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, but we could ask you how you would describe financial wellness. And if you would go ahead and write your answers in the question box, we can um, share some of those. So I do see that some of you we're unhappy with um, how we weren't coming through loud and clear. I hope that's improved now. Dorley, is it better? Well, Sorry, I had it on mute. Okay. Yes, it's, it, once I spoke to you, you much better. Yes. Okay, great. We're getting some responses here. Um, overall ability to survive and thrive financially. Uh, being able to afford the things you need as well as some things you want. Have a sense of control over your finances and not be co controlled by your finances. These are some great answers. Little or no consumer debt. Being comfortable and confident managing money and financial challenges that are inevitable in the course of a lifetime. The ability not to have to worry about finances all the time an overall understanding of your finances and being comfortable with your money, being in control of your money. Income is more than expenses. Financial wellness is the feeling of balance between income, debt, and achieved goals. 
Okay. Wow. Thank you all. I think we'll need to keep moving, but hopefully I can share some more of these later on. Um, I had told Irene from uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that we have a great group that always participates. So I was right. Thanks, everybody. But let's keep going. So this is kind of our working definition at the moment. Financial wellness is having a comprehensive understanding of your current financial circumstances and having the skills and motivation to manage your money in a manner which consistently improves your present financial situation and contributes to a financially stable and secure future. And when you hear, I, I think that kind of includes a lot of the things that many of you um, just shared with us. Uh, and then when you hear Irene, uh, I think her definition will, will be different. I know her definition will be different. But here's a graphic saying that it, financial well-being is feeling competent to manage your money to create a better financial future today and for the future. And it means knowing what steps are needed to be taken and taking them. And it's the ability to navigate life's events. It's more than just setting financial goals. It's actually building towards them. And my last slide here is understanding financial well-being requires recognizing how well someone, a client or yourself, makes ends meet, plans ahead financially, chooses and manages financial products, and possesses and uses the money management skills and knowledge to make healthy financial decisions. Decisions. Oh, I forgot. Yes, we have this one poll. Let me go ahead and do this poll with you. You will recognize it, I hope, um, from our presentation today. Excuse me. We, we wanted to actually ask this question, I believe, after Irene makes her presentation. Okay. Well, I believe that since I opened it, it has to be asked now. Okay. Sorry. I, that's okay. I appreciate that. Um, this is uh, the best we can do once it's open i don't think we can't open it again i thought it would be interesting to see the responses before irene's presentation irene i don't know what you're thinking is on it but not too many people want to vote on this we're just up to 30 percent Okay, we're over 50%. I'll go ahead if you want to vote. Um, I'm hopeful that you all are, ob are able to select as many of the different uh, ones as are appropriate. Okay, so we got up to 75%. Um, let me go ahead and close that poll. And, okay, 80% of you voted. Now let me show you the response. So 21% of you encourage clients to live within their means, but the major, major area, and maybe you can talk more to this, Irene, as we go into your presentation, would be identifying and helping clients with steps to improve uh, their financial well-being and uh, you'll see in Irene's graphic that it's much more complex than that but I only um, get so many spaces in the answers for our polls so I'm going to go ahead and hide that poll and I do believe okay I am going to turn this over to Irene so
Wilson, can you hear me? I can. Thank you. Okay, great. All right, let me, I think we're switching to the show my screen. Hang on one second while I get this in slideshow mode. Okay, does everyone see my first slide? Yep, we Linda, do. Do you see my first slide? I do. Great, okay, <laughs> good. We got the technology to work. Great, well, thank you so much, Rita and Dorley. I really appreciate this opportunity to come and talk to you, at least uh, at least uh, via the phone, uh, and hopefully someday in person as well. Um, as, uh, as Rita said, I'm with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, and I'm with the Office of Financial Education. Let me see if my screen advancing works. Yes. Um, so before I start, we just always do our standard uh, uh, disclaimer that uh, we're not giving you legal uh, or regulatory guidance or advice. Um, that we are um, sharing uh, primarily our own views. I have to start it with that. So probably most of you are familiar, or at least have heard of the CFPB, I hope. We are the new federal agency in town. We were started just about four years ago in the wake of the financial crisis um, as the new bank regulator, but we also have a mission around helping, uh, helping consumers. So we both um, do education to help consumers um, to navigate the financial marketplace. We supervise and enforce financial institutions and other financial providers, including things like payday lenders and debt collectors and a lot of um, entities that had not been uh, the sub uh, subject to much um, regulatory activity before um, in order to enforce federal consumer financial laws. And then we study. We gather data about consumers, about financial service providers, about the market, so we can better understand how consumers are faring in the, um, in the consumer finance marketplace. Um, so we have both a large part of the Bureau which does the regulatory enforcement and market kind of market work, but I am on the consumer-facing side of the Bureau the Consumer Education and Engagement Division. Uh, we have several units within that division. Some do special populations like older Americans, service members, uh, students. Um, the Financial Empowerment Office does um, economically vulnerable consumers, which for those of you doing financial social work, probably a lot of you are um, dealing with folks in that situation. And so that office has a number of uh, tools and resources that might be helpful. And then the financial education, the unit that I'm in, we're looking kind of across all consumers how we can educate and consume uh, and um, empower consumers to make better informed decisions. So that's just where I sit at the Bureau. And then within that context, we are both strengthening channels to get FinEd to consumers, and by that we mean folks like you working with the field, with financial educators, with all types of different um, intermediaries out there who talk to consumers, uh, doing some direct-to-consumer work, and then also, again, doing research to better understand um, best practices and, uh, and consumer behavior. So before I start on the... Uh, well-being piece, I just want to say a couple quick words. We do have a fairly new effort called the CFPB Financial Education Exchange, or FinEx, and this is something you can sign up for where you'll get regular updates from us about new resources, new tools. Um, uh, we are, have our own webinars and convenings and things like that. So uh, for those of you interested, you just email the CFPB underscore FinEx at cfpb.gov email address uh, you see at the bottom. Just saying, sign me up, and um, I monitor that inbox, and you will get a, a kind of welcome email, and then just get some periodic information from us. So I just want to let you know that that's out there. Um, we also have a LinkedIn discussion group um, that allows you to put your own material up, as well as get posts from us. And again, I, I moderate that group, so I encourage everyone to join. Um, at the end, I'll put the link up, but you could always just uh, search for it in uh, LinkedIn. And then lastly, um, we have an a inventory of all the resources we have for financial educators um, that's available on our website. Um, uh, the link's at the top, adult financial education, adult-financial-education, very catchy. Um, but we also do K-12 work so that it has its own page. Um, and this inventory is something you can print or look at. It has a whole bunch of stuff the Bureau has. So I just want to let you know that that's there uh, in case you want to access both the report I'm going to talk about as well as a lot of other stuff wanted to put that in front of you before we start. So now we've gotten the, the uh, housekeeping out of the way, I will uh, talk about our well-being work. Now I know that this group is very, uh, financial social work is very practical. It's about, it's about tools and resources to actually do your work uh, and to get financial topics into the world of social work, and I really appreciate that. Um, this presentation is a little conceptual, though at the end I will try to link it more to practice. Um, and as I was talking to Rita and Dorley in planning this, I was saying, well, we are actually, because we've just done this initial research, we are trying to figure out how to put some of this in practice. Some of this you guys are already doing in, in, instinctively or just as part of your regular training. 
but um, going forward, I just want to kind of give the invitation that we would love to learn more from practitioners like all of you about how you might actually be implementing some of the things I'm about to talk about. So it's maybe a little um, different from some of the usual presentations you get on these webinars, but we really want to put to really think through the kind of how-to about this and would love uh, thoughts from all of you in, in different settings, both now and in the future, about how to do that. So why did we do this project? Well, for those of you in the financial education field, and I know that most of you guys probably aren't, you're more in, right, in social work, um, we're always trying to figure out, you know, what, what is the goal of thin ed? You don't want someone to just know how to calculate compound interest. That's lovely, but really, you know, who cares? It only matters if it helps you uh, achieve your life goals, we think. And there's been, um, there hasn't been a single way of, of defining the goal of financial education, financial capability, financial literacy, all those different terms people know, I mean, maybe even financial social work, um, to really uh, define what it is we're trying to achieve as an end goal. Um, and there's also interest nationally and internationally in, in defining that. So there's been in some, some international OECD documents who stated that financial well-being is the ultimate goal of all this different kind of financial education type work. But no one had really defined what financial well-being meant. And so we decided to do a research project um, to try to create a definition by talking to consumers, by really having it come from the consumer perspective as well as practitioners. Um, and then try to figure out what knowledge, skills, attitudes, and behaviors went into well-being. And then eventually, and it's the phase we're in now, I'll just mention at the end, actually develop a scale or a, a survey, a questionnaire that could, could measure well-being, and then we could test that. So um, that was why we're doing it. We really want to figure out what is this well-being thing that we're all uh, kind of trying to move towards. And obviously, based on what Rita said earlier, there's already some definitions out there. So this, is, uh, this will resonate, I think, with a lot of the things that Rita already said. Um, but let me go ahead and tell you about it. So just what we did, we researched uh, via contractors or synthesized the literature review. We did one-on-one -on -one qualitative interviews with a group of consumers, both working age and older, and financial professionals, so people doing financial education, uh, working with clients in different ways, and then consulted with assorted experts. And based on that, we came up with a four-part definition, which will be on the next slide, so hang on there for one second, um, and then a set of kind of inputs, or we call them drivers, or things that we think are, are uh, lead to financial well-being. And that's where I think a lot of the interesting stuff is. So bear with me through the definition, and then we'll get into the kind of the, the, uh, the drivers, the causes may be too strong, but the things behind financial well-being. So to put it in a single sentence, financial well-being is a state of being wherein person can fully meet their current and ongoing financial obligations, feel secure in their financial future, and make choices that allow the enjoyment of, uh, of life. So the elements would be having control over your day-to-day, month-to-month finances, having the capacity to absorb a financial shock, being on track to meet financial goals, and having the financial freedom to make choices that allow, uh, allow one to enjoy life. Um, and I'm going to now put it in another way on the next slide, which is it sort of breaks down across two broad categories, um, security and freedom of choice in the present and the future. So control of your day-to-day -day finances is kind of security in the present. Um, ability to absorb a financial shock or an emergency is security in the future. Um, financial freedom to make choices in life is freedom of choice, of course, in the present. And then meeting longer-term financial goals is freedom of choice in the future. And what I find interesting about this, and actually someone pointed this out once, is that um, they said, you know, Financial educators always talk about making budgets and managing your spending and, you know, doing all this kind of dreary technical sort of sounding stuff. And the way financial, the sort of financial marketplace markets to people, is we're, right, you look at bank ads and stuff and they'll say we're selling you, you know, freedom and we're selling you security and stability. Those are kind of terms that appeal more to people's aspirations or life goals rather than, just, you know, make a budget and keep to it, which doesn't sound like fun. So what I like about this, uh, what people said, is that it, it kind of captures people's life aspirations more um, and then shows you kind of the buckets, you know, you need to work on to, to, to kind of have some of those. So I, I think that's kind of a nice way to think about it. The other thing that I think is interesting about this, and again, it's for financial educators, and, um, and I'm hoping for social workers as well, is that um, a lot of times financial education programs are measuring something, like they're measuring, um, you know, how much savings people have, or they're measuring you know, people buying houses, but some people in the program are just trying to make ends meet and they're working on different things. And this type of a, a grid, while that wasn't the original purpose, means you can sort of say, you know what, we're really working on box one. 
we're trying to get struggling clients to get to get hold of their day-to-day -day finances. So don't measure metrics in box four until people are ready for that. And so if, for some programs, I think it helps to think about where does their work fit. Again, programs may be doing this anyways, but this may help people say, hey, we're really in box two of that COPB definition, so let's think about how we best achieve the, the goals in, in box two. So this is the definition. Um, it, it was interesting because some of the stuff people said earlier in your definitions when you were typing them in uh, actually mapped really nicely onto this, so thank you. I'm going to take that as, as affirmation. Um, uh, uh, so, and remember, for FinEd, often in the old days, uh, we would think about giving people information and then they make better decisions. And this is really much more, you know, and I think in some ways coming out of social work, you folks know this better just based on what Rita said earlier about understanding people's emotions and understanding their relationship to money and that it's much more complicated than information leads to, leads to action or behavior change and that we're trying to capture some of that here. Um, so now I'm going to talk about, so what, what goes into that? Well, first I'm going to show you an even more complicated diagram. Um, to me, this looks like a, um, a uh, architectural diagram. I see rooms, I see hallways, but that's not what it's supposed to be. This is um, just, I, I want to put this out there because we want to make sure people understand when we're talking about financial well-being, we're not saying that everything else in someone else's li someone's life doesn't matter. So well-being is at the far right of this, this, room, <laughs> this uh, room, room chart here. Um, that's kind of, you know, where you are, how, how your financial well-being, you know, how satisfied you are. Um, that matters. Uh, what, you know, leads to that is your behavior and the opportunities available to you. So opportunities means, you know, are there banks in your neighborhood? You have lots of other complicated issues that mean you don't have certain opportunities. And some of that is very much a function of that far left box, social and economic environment. So everything going on in someone's life, where they grew up, the neighborhood, their family, their income, that all matters hugely. We totally get that. And there are lots of people and lots of agencies, and all of you guys probably are working on those issues. So those are unbelievably important. For the purposes of this definition, though, we are just going to focus on what could a financial educator do right now. So someone needs to be working on those big issues, right? Getting people child care, getting them, you know, getting them better education, all that stuff matters. What the CFPB and what financial educators can do right now is, I would argue, is these three things. Personality and attitude, and, and even that's somewhat uh, what you could do about it is complicated. We'll set that aside for a minute you know, what you actually do and your knowledge and skills. So those three circles are what the definition focuses on while acknowledging that everything else is incredibly important. The overall environment, the opportunities, and then decision context is sort of how a decision, a decision is framed. So things like how the choice is presented to you, what is the default, all that behavioral economic stuff. Um, and that systems generally have to change that as opposed to the person. So. That's up there, it's important, but the definition will focus on these three circles. Again, I just want to make sure everyone hears me. We really think all the other things are unbelievably important, but we're only going to talk about these three today. Holding all those other things constant, what can we do in these three circles? So, of those three things, behavior, uh, personality, attitudes, and financial knowledge and skills, I'll look first at financial behavior. And four behaviors, and again, I suspect a lot of you will say, well, of course, that makes sense. Um, the four behaviors that we hypothesize um, lead to financial well-being are effective routine money management, uh, financial research and knowledge seeking, so knowing how to find uh, information if you don't have it, financial planning and goal setting, and following through on financial decisions. And those things we think of in these four little circles just to give us something to make it easier to remember of balance, ask, plan, or act. Sometimes we say manage, ask, plan, or act. I think we haven't quite decided which it should be, but we'll leave it at balance for right now. So um, these four types of behaviors matter. And what I'll note just here is that the ACT one is the one that I think, it was interesting, in your poll, you guys chose that as your highest, most important one, which is really interesting to me. I think maybe it's because you're social workers. I think financial education often has focused more on give people the information again and, you know, have them develop a financial plan, but don't, doesn't always get to the, okay, how do you act on that? And so the fact that you guys voted that high is great. And the fact that I think it sounds like you're working on that. It's wonderful. But so these are the, the financial behaviors we hypothesize are drivers of the financial financial well-being. Irene, just okay. let me let me say that probably yes. the majority of our attendees are not social workers. I'm guessing oh. that the majority are financial educators. That they're working oh. in agencies. 
Um, I think I thought that was important to point out because when because they did pick act and they mm -hmm. do and I do believe that the work they do is geared to action. So I I think that that for you to see that would be important. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Good. Well, I take back everything I just said. <laughs> um, great. Well, that's, that's great. Glad that it's a diverse audience. Um, and I'm glad that people are, I think, really focusing more on the act, no matter where you are coming from. Um, all right. So that's that. Now we'll move on to financial knowledge. So what kind of financial knowledge do people need to, for financial, uh, to achieve financial well-being? And this I'll say a little bit more about because the existing literature really shows that, and again, I referenced this earlier, factual knowledge is not enough, right? Knowing interest rate may be linked to financial well-being, but maybe not. Um, uh, and certainly, I think a lot of us, myself personally, resonate with the idea that just knowing I shouldn't eat cookies does not mean I don't eat cookies. Um, and, you know, <laughs> and my waistline is evidence of that. So obviously, the relationship between knowledge and behavior is complicated, and it's mediated by a lot of other things. And so we tried to create, again, based on these consumer interviews, a, a slightly different concept. And my apologies at putting yet another term into that mix of, you know, education capability literacy that we all, um, I think, deal with in this field. But um, we posited something called financial ability. And here's the definition of financial ability. It's a part of financial knowledge. And it's really not necessarily what you know, but the types of things that you know and how to, how to do things. So particularly knowing when and how to find information. So I don't need to know everything about how to buy a house, but I need to know how to find it. I need to know where to find it, where to look, who to trust. Um, I you need to know how to process financial information to see does it apply to me. So I can go read something about, you know, estates and trusts, but if I'm, you know, if I don't have the money to do that, it doesn't apply to me. And so sometimes figuring out what things are relevant to you or not is, is a skill as well. And then knowing how to execute, knowing how to keep on track, how to, how to actually um, make things happen, how to, how to um, act on your um, goals is another, is another um, type of financial ability. So knowing what, it's not just what you know, but knowing how to do it that matters. So one might ask what influences financial ability, and that's very complicated, and you know, upbringing, social context, personal networks, personal observation, education, lots of stuff. We don't untangle that in this study, but just note that these things are important, and they may be things that are, um, uh, the, the financial ability may be things that are teachable. Again, focusing from, you know, just a piece of knowledge to, again, how to find knowledge and apply it. So that's financial ability. And then the last bucket on our uh, kind of three-part set of drivers into financial well-being is a personal trait. And again, no, no surprises here, I think, but the idea of internal frame of reference really matters. So comparing yourself to your own standards and not to, not to others. So um, keeping, to, keeping your goals front and center. Uh, perseverance, which is being highly motivated to stay on track in the face of obstacles. Um, executive functioning, this is kind of a new a topic a lot of people are talking about these days. But that's I mean, the ability or the tendency to plan for the future, to control impulses, to think creatively, to address challenges. So a lot of research in this area uh, in kids um, and, and when and, uh, and what ages people develop executive function and um, the uh, relative uh, rates of executive function in certain, <laughs> in certain genders and, uh, and teenage years and stuff, a topic of great interest to some of us. The executive function often develops slower than everyone, other cognitive skills, which leads to many challenges for parents. But that's a whole other field. But executive function clearly matters. Um, and then lastly, financial self-efficacy. So believing in your ability to influence your financial outcomes. People call that money confidence, right? There's other things that that kind of means. So these are personal traits, um, but there's certainly some evidence that they could be influenced, or if not taught, at least we can help people develop some of the some of the um, some of these some of these qualities. Um, again, there's been a lot done around executive function coaching and kids, um, uh, uh, and uh, especially kids with um, you know ADHD. And so some of that some of those general ideas I think are interesting to think about how we could apply to this context. So, what does all that mean? So we have this definition of well-being, that four-part box. We have um, the three drivers, which each had their own set of sub-bullets. Um, what does all that mean? Well, it's nice. We're sharing with the field now. There's a written report on this that we you know, encourage you to look at and read. Um, what we're doing, this, we consider this a foundation. 
So what we're doing right now, and it's actually close to being done, is developing an actual measurement tool, so a scale, a questionnaire, somewhere, somewhere between 10 and 20 questions. Um, my colleague is working on this. And it will actually be a scorable questionnaire. It will give you a well-being score, um, and that is going to be tested in the field in a large survey to see uh, if, it's, um, if it's valid. It's actually been tested by people who do survey development and question design in the educational space. So it's, it's actually pretty interesting. Um, very simple questions, but we think they have some pretty good ability on this um, financial well-being scale idea. And that we will share very broadly probably this fall with the field. Anyone can use it. We're already trying to get it inserted into other you know, surveys and, and other places so we can continue to test it. So that will be out soon. We then plan to do the third bullet, the hypothesis testing, is to really then do other, and this is all you know, in the long run and, and lots, to, lots of details to be, to be um, firmed up, but to actually test those hypotheses, to look at um, can we really look at the impact of person, personal traits as opposed to financial behaviors in financial well-being. Um, and so there will be, we hope, additional work in that area. We'll encourage others to do that kind of research as well. And in the middle one, I do want to note, for those of you who work at all with kids, we did um, have uh, another piece of this work that looked at um, the impact of, uh, or how, how to extend these ideas to kids. So how do people develop these sets of um, behaviors and traits? And it's actually already been a, an academic article in the Journal of Consumer Affairs on this um, topic, uh, looking at the different um, uh, impact of different um, uh, different types of skills on different ages, and uh, it's it's pretty interesting looking at sort of you know preschoolers versus middle middle meaning sort of six to twelve year old, and then high school age kids uh, finding that you can start on executive function training when kids are little, which is really about needs versus wants. It's not about money. Kids don't really understand money when they're five year olds uh, in general, but you can start helping helping them develop you know um, uh, executive function in the middle grades it's, or the middle ages. It's really around financial socialization, so beginning to understand um, money habits uh, and um, you know, how, how people kind of develop money habits. And then in the older grades, particularly a focus on experiential learning when you can really start to try out with, with real money. And so there's some academic research behind that. Um, there'll be more things coming out on that, but I'll just note we've been trying to, again, to extend this kind of work to, to young people. And so what we really what we think is unique about this is again it's a consumer derived definition of financial well-being which we hope can uh, help inform um, you know, other work on well-being and on financial education. We have some testable hypotheses that we intend to, to test those drivers of well-being, um, and then uh, the financial ability idea, which is sort of a new twist on on, on some ideas people are already familiar with. Uh, and so trying to pull all that together into a framework that will help link together policy, practice, and research. So that's all very conceptual and kind of kind of interesting, and I would love to hear what people think and love to hear your questions. Before we do that, I'm going to just quickly say, well, how do, how do we apply this in practice? And again, I think a, a lot of folks on the phone and out in the field are already doing that. We have just I just a few slides um, of sort of very straightforward ideas on how you might apply some of this in practice at a bit of a high level. Um, but I'll just show you these, and then we can open up for questions and discussion and, and any thoughts people have. So the first of those four um, aspects of um, uh, financial behavior, uh, of the, the balance or manage of living within your means, financial educators and others can try to help people develop sound habits um, uh, around money management. Um, so ideas include practicing contentment. So it's good, again, that issue of um, measuring against your own goals and not against those of others, um, and cutting down mindless spending or spending that doesn't fit into your own you know, long-term goals. Um, staying out of debt, using debt res uh, credit responsibly, that's kind of one that I think everybody is concerned about. And then one of the things that the definition talks about, or some of the underlying research, is that you can also think about the income side of things and think about ways to generate additional income, um, avoid interruptions in paid work, to kind of try to keep that um, living within the means piece um, in balance. Uh, looking at the ask part, which is gathering information and evaluating um, financial information, financial educators can try to help people ask the right questions and find facts and, 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 uh, and apply the information. So identifying situations where they need financial information, um, exploring with them how to get trustworthy information. So you know, how do you find stuff that you can um, believe and, and, and trust and be careful about your sources of information, and then deciding what choice really applies to them and what makes sense for them. 
so again, that's sort of part of that financial um, financial research, financial ability um, part of the definition. The third, which is the plan on the Balance Ask Plan Act framework, um, is helping people to plan for the future, to connect their life aspirations for the future to concrete plans. So again, making those big dreams concrete. So identifying specific and realistic goals. And clients come in and say, I want to buy a house. And you say, okay, well, let's think. That's maybe a three-year proposal. You know, let's for six months, let's work on fixing your credit and really breaking, um, uh, really it's the second bullet, making step-by-step -step plans to reach those goals uh, and make those achievable goals. And then to try to help people feel more confident about their ability to make a difference in their own lives. It's that financial efficacy or confidence idea. It came up earlier um, in one of uh, somebody's answer to the original question that Rita had asked. And then lastly, ACT, and um, this one's kind of my personal favorite because it is that how do you act on, on what you know and the plan you have to set yourself up for success. Um, and here we want to help people carry out decisions consistently by figuring out, uh, figuring out with clients how to take the steps needed to put decisions into action, determining how to motivate themselves. Um, I would love to learn more about that. I have a big writing project that I've been vigorously avoiding all day. so. <laughs> Important for all of us, no matter what our situation. And then take advantage of existing ways from, you know, automatic payments to peer support to, to simplify staying on track. So what kind of things can, resources can people mobilize to, to help, help keep themselves on track once they've determined a goal. So these are all fairly um, generic. And again, I would, uh, as this work goes forward, we'll be doing more research, but I'm actually out working with practitioners a lot trying to gather ideas about how to make some of these things happen, what are people really doing in practice. And so again, I invite everyone to share that either on the call or um, in other ways. So the last thing I'll do is just put up a way again to kind of keep the conversation going. Um, all of the, this paper along with a shorter uh, little two-pager on how you can help, it's actually um, um, some of the bullets I just shared were drawn from this. You can find that along with our resource inventory and other things on the adult financial education page. Uh, consumerfinance.gov, which is the Bureau's website, adult-financial-education. And there's a whole bunch of stuff on there, including at this in the inventory that lists all of our resources. Um, if you want to sign up for the Financial Education Exchange that I mentioned at the beginning, which is a way for, to get sort of ongoing information from us in a fairly light touch way, email the CFPB Phoenix um, inbox, CFPB underscore Phoenix at CFPB.gov. And actually, if you have any other thoughts you want to share on this work that we don't get to today, I check that box every day, so feel free to also send things to that. Um, and then lastly, for the discussion group, LinkedIn, it's a bit of an unwieldy link. It's easiest just to go to uh, groups in LinkedIn and search for CFPB Financial Education Discussion Group. But if anyone can write quickly, that's the, the direct link to that group if you want to join. And again, we post regularly bureau, bureau tools, updates, and others can put things up. So. Uh, lots of other FinEd organizations put up their stuff as well or post questions, things like that. So I am going to stop there. And now I believe I am supposed to turn the control. I'm going to let go, you know, give up control and give the keyboard and the mouse back to Rita, who will lead us in the question and answer portion. Okay, I think I did it. I think you did it. Hey, everybody. Um, if you have questions, now would be the time um, to be sharing them so that we can get them to Irene and she can answer them. In the meantime, I would like to um, just tell everyone about uh, the Financial Social Work Certification because when I gave you the 10 goals of financial social work earlier, um, when we first started the presentation, I think that um, those goals are kind of pre everything that Irene just talked about. Um, we, I believe in our graduates and all of you, I think, who register for all of our webinars and like us and follow us, uh, understand how important behavior is and how clients really need to be in a place where they can take those steps that Irene is uh, not just suggesting, but what the research shows uh, people need to 
uh, be able to do to achieve financial well-being. So this is these are the basics um, of the certification. Uh, there are the five workbooks I just showed you on the previous slide. It is self-paced, self-study. Our students have six months to complete it and two weeks to uh, complete the online exam. It does include 20 CEUs from National NASW and the cost is only $495. Additionally, um, we recently um, kind of soft um, introduced, uh, launched the Financial Therapy Network, uh, which is our sister site. Uh, it's on Facebook and Twitter also. We're also on LinkedIn, but uh, just as uh, Irene pointed out, that link for FaceDin, uh, the link to, to get to uh, LinkedIn is very, very long. So we'll be offering financial support groups for women on this website. Um, we'll be launching our affiliate program and our consumer program, My Money, Myself, the uh, self-help program. Uh, where consumers can benefit from all of the work and philosophy and interactive uh, aspects of financial social work. So now let's go ahead to the questions. But first, let me say thank you so much, Irene. I think that was so perfect and so great. And I'm guessing that everyone on the session did too. So here's a question. When younger people are on fixed income due to disability or joblessness requiring government assistance, how do you help them accumulate money for goals without getting them ineligible for assistance uh, too soon and to their detriment? Do you understand that, Irene? I know. Yes, I understand that. People are hitting asset limits. No, I get that. And you know, obviously, that's a huge issue. Um, and our our you know, our definition of well-being offers offers no insights into that. Um, our Office of Financial Empowerment is trying to do some work on asset limits, so that's real. It's interesting. I presented this to um, this this concept to a group of um, folks in in Dallas. Who are mostly dealing with, you know, people with a lot of challenges. So again, folks like what you describe, people on a lot of things, and a lot of them said, you know, this is what you're describing is too far off from our right? well-being. Like we just need us, we need stability before well-being, and we hear that this is not meant to be a everyone's going to have financial well-being, you know, after a few months working with a financial educator. So clearly, a lot of what you're describing is fitting into that first, that very first far left box. If you remember my my, my room plan um, of the social and economic conditions, we need to work on things like asset limits and, and, and adequate income and benefits and all that is hugely important and financial education is not gonna not gonna solve that. So I, I hear I hear the the difficulties implicit in your questions and I, I wish I had a you know <laughs> a simple solution. But thank you for raising that. Well it's certainly something that, that I hear a great deal about and it it just comes back to the fact that the system doesn't encourage personal emotional growth along with financial growth. It's it's a huge problem, um, and I I love that someone asked the question and regret that um, we we don't have more tools to address it. Um, again, that psychosocial aspect of financial social work really helps uh, someone working with clients to identify more of what it is they want out of life and be able to be in a better position uh, to possibly make um, those difficult choices. Um, and I guess we should move on to the next one. Can you recommend materials for young learners transitioning for high, from high school to a, a first job or going away to college? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, you know, there are, I mean, I, I generally can't recommend things outside of the Bureau's resources, but we do have a number of, of, uh, of resources. There is a whole, on our, the CFPP website, consumerfinance.gov, there's a whole section on paying for college, 
which includes both um, uh, financial aid but also student debt, which is by far the more uh, used part of that website. So that's only a part of what you're addressing. Um, we actually have a new set of um, brief little like four-page guides called the Newcomer's Guides. And we developed them for people new to this country. It was really sort of uh, loosely speaking intended for immigrants, people coming from another financial system um, who may not be familiar with, um, with you know, money, money issues here. But I think what we found, it only came out a few months ago, um, is that they're actually helpful for someone new, sort of new to the workforce as well, talking about ways to pay bills, ways to receive your money, how to choose financial products. Uh, it doesn't address like retirement and, and early work, you know, workforce issues. So. Some of those things, so those are all, those things are on our website. Um, there's also some pieces of the, we have a, a toolkit actually for social workers, ironically, and others dealing with clients but not doing financial education as their kind of primary job called Your Money, Your Goals Toolkit. And that has a number of worksheets and things for um, people sort of navigating their own financial lives. Uh, it's, uh, the main target is, is is sort of practitioners like social workers, but all the tools in there are for clients. So that would be another piece. But we don't have anything specifically packaged as new to the workforce, here's what you need. So some of those things I mentioned can help people piece together what they need. Um, so that's, you know, with, with some things, maybe not exactly what you're looking for. I will again point out that the materials on the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau website are many, deep, and broad. Um, and that uh, could you talk a moment about um, how people can file complaints with? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, certainly. Um, you know, one of the things I think that are is um, is a real resource that we really try to promote uh, across you know everywhere we go is our submit a complaint um, our, 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 our um, service. So. Um, like many regulators, we have a way to submit complaints, but unlike some regulators, we actually um, forward those complaints to um, the financial institution or product provider who is then um, mandated to reply. So if people have issues with their bank or with their student lender or with their mortgage lender or with a credit, credit reporting agency, um, and they've tried to you know, deal with those agencies directly and don't always get the response they want, if they go through our system, we will um, we often will get more attention uh, as the regulator than than in some cases the consumer would when they try directly. Um, and so we have this uh, submit a complaint function is on our website. Um, um, on the main page, there's a submit a complaint sort of tab. We also have a phone line that will take complaints in 180 something languages. We have translation services for multiple languages, which is which is great. Um, and when you submit a complaint. But when a client submits a complaint, um, we will route it. So if it, in some cases, if we don't have jurisdiction, we'll send it to another regulator. Otherwise, we will send it to the financial service provider. Um, and you will get a response. Um, the financial provider will you know, either say, oh, yeah, there was a mistake. We'll fix it. Or, no, there's not a mistake. And here's where the confusion was. And then you have the opportunity to appeal if you um, don't agree with the, um, with, with the um the response that you get. And so we have to date taken um, almost uh, approaching 700,000 complaints over four years in almost every financial product imaginable. Um, and the other neat thing about it is it's now a uh, public, so one, I encourage people to use it. Um, you can submit for someone else, so there's some kind of parameters around that, so you're better off having a person submit it themselves while you sort of help them. Um, uh, and actually, on our website, we have a webinar on consumer complaints. If you go to that adult financial education page, you can listen to a webinar that will give more detail on consumer complaints and how to do the third person, um, you know, on, on behalf of someone else uh, function, if any of you uh, want to do that. Um, and then we make that data available, um, stripped of any, uh, you know, any personal information. So you can actually look in your zip code by product and see what kind of complaints with institution name there. So you can see. Um, you, know, you get a sense of what kind of complaints people are, are filing, and we also have a new function to share the narrative. So you can actually read the stories, of what, again, stripped of you know, names and account information, obviously, but you can read some of the experiences other people are having with, um, with institutions. It's actually quite educational um, and may help your own clients to see, you know, oh, look, here's, here's what other people are facing, and in some cases, here's what they did. So I definitely encourage that as a, as a, as a service. We also use that data to look at market conditions, say, oh, we're seeing a lot of, you know, payday loan complaints from this place, let's go look at it, or this region, or, so it informs our, our other work as well, so it's a way to kind of get, 
voice is heard, as well as a sort of individual complaint resolution service. So definitely encourage people to use that. Well, I do want to tell you, Irene, that we're getting many thank yous for the wonderful presentation. So I wanted to be sure to tell you that. And also the people are saying that this is information that they can um, utilize on their jobs. So um, I knew that was going to be the reality, and we're so glad that you came. I guess we have time for one more question, and I think it's one I know it's one I can answer, and I don't know if you have input on it, Irene. Um, do you think that facilitating growth towards financial well-being is more effective one-on-one -on -one or in a group setting? Hmm. That's a very interesting question. You know, we don't, I don't have, I mean, I don't have definitive research on that, um, and so anything I say would be my own opinion. I mean, I think it's probably going to depend on, you know, the person, the setting, the issue, the challenge, all that. Um, we do have a new study on financial coaching, which is one-on-one -on -one, that's about to come out um, that shows, you know, positive results. But again, I think it's so contingent on other aspects of the intervention and the person and the challenge that it's probably hard to say. Well, Rita, what do you think about that? I have a lot that I think about it. And something that I'd like to say about it is that it's it's just a very different experience. I am a huge proponent of groups. The uh, power of the group and the group experience is incredibly um, life-changing. Uh, in the previous slide I had shown that we are doing online support groups for women. Uh, we have a support kit um, on our website uh, for doing support groups with clients. Uh, but one-on-one -on -one work, obviously, you can address things um, more individually, the client's needs, uh, and, and work in a different way. Again, all of uh, the, the work you're doing, this report, I mean, is just going to move uh, all of the profession forward. Uh, so it is invaluable. All of us have our own experiences. I would certainly love to find a way to do something more interactive so we could take more questions and give more answers. Uh, but from my perspective, I think there's great value in one-on-one -on -one work and in group work. And I would encourage everyone working with clients to consider um, both, either individually or working with a group and one-on-one um, -on -one with a client. Someone did ask what value there would be in taking uh, financial social work certification if they're not doing financial education right now. Um, this work was created. Our students do go through the process of improving their own financial futures in order to be better role models um, for their clients uh, and so that we know that our students have the ability to improve their own financial futures as well in, as well as helping clients to do that. Uh, when we launched My Money Myself, our consumer program on our uh, financial therapy network next month and you'll all be getting an invitation to that launching with prizes and surprises. Um, we will have uh, that consumer program at um, considerably uh, lower cost for people who um, don't need to get certified. But again, the certification does include 20 CEUs. So I think that even though we have more questions coming in, um, we will go ahead uh, and end today's session thanking Irene and thanking all of you um, for joining us today. I, I apologize for any questions we didn't get to, but um, Irene has been kind enough to stay on past um, the three o'clock ending time. So thanks everybody and um, you can always contact us uh, here at the Center for Financial Social Work um, if you have any more questions or need some answers. Um, the uh, recording will be on the website by the beginning of the week and those everyone who registered should get it in their inbox. Irene, thank you so very much and ha everybody have a beautiful rest of the day. Hope to see you back here next month. Bye now.